Welcome to the webinar, Preparing the Manufacturing Supply Chain for a Post-2020 World. In today's webinar, we're going to hear from our panel of experts on the changes that manufacturers, retailers, food producers, and other supply chain stakeholders will need to implement to make sure the massive disruption we saw in early 2020 doesn't happen again. Before we dive in, I'd like to go through a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets you can use. All the widgets are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. Please note the slides will advance automatically throughout the presentation. To enlarge the slides, click the Enlarge Slides button in the top right-hand corner of your presentation window. We encourage you to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation using the Q&A widget. We'll try to answer your questions during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Please know we do capture all questions. Okay, let's get right to it. My name is Megan Billingsley, and today I'm pleased to lead this discussion on preparing the supply chain for 2021 and beyond. 2020 has been an unprecedented year. The pandemic has changed the way we go to work, the way we shop, and how we live. Some of these changes fade with a vaccine and more established medical treatments for COVID-19, but many of them are here to stay. Many in the supply chain are calling this the new normal. Consumers have shifted much of their buying online to avoid crowds and lower infection risks. This has accelerated growth in the e-commerce sector by five years or more. And the e-commerce sector is expecting to keep a good portion of that market share. Meanwhile, producers have suffered plant shutdowns and struggled to implement appropriate social distancing and hygiene measures within facilities that will allow them to operate safely. This disparity between producer and consumer has turned the supply chain as we know it on its head. In response, supply chain leaders have been rapidly implementing changes to boost resiliency and responsiveness to future disruptions. While we're beginning to hear the term post-pandemic used more frequently, the truth is that COVID-19 will continue to cause disruptions and policy shifts in manufacturing for some time to come. This new normal is a world where everything is in flux. Supply chain leaders must begin to implement changes now to ensure they're prepared for whatever comes next. I'm excited to be here today with these three experts who have all been on the front lines of the pandemic developing new ways to navigate supply chain issues in these troubling times. First, we're pleased to have Phil, go try and, okay, do that again. I'm excited to be here today with these three experts who have all been on the front lines of the pandemic, developing new ways to navigate supply chain issues in these troubling times. First, we're pleased to have Phil Gotrin with us today. Phil is the general manager of Generics Group North America, a software developer that has engineered a comprehensive suite of supply chain optimization solutions. Phil has been the general manager of Generics Group North America since 2019, Prior to this, Phil has accumulated almost 30 years of supply chain and logistics experience, overseeing hundreds of projects in the U.S., Canada, and Europe. Next, we also have Doug Mefford, who is the Product Marketing Director at Generics Group. Doug has more than 25 years of experience in the supply chain industry, from inventory control to operational leadership within an omni-channel distribution operation. Prior to Generics, Doug Mefford was the Operations Manager for the Dallas Cowboys, overseeing their warehouse operations, retail distribution, silkscreen manufacturing, and direct-to-consumer order fulfillment. And finally, we also have Salvador Benitez with us today, who is the VP of Pellet Operations for Yakima Chief Hops, a grower-owned provider of hops sourced in the Pacific Northwest. He focuses on streamlining production processes across multiple manufacturing facilities. Our webinar today will follow this format. First, we'll discuss some of the strategies that supply chain and logistics leaders are using to create a stronger supply chain environment. After that, we're going to discuss the benefits of proactive capabilities, and we'll wrap up with a discussion about how recent events have impacted the way manufacturers, retailers, and other supply chain stakeholders must operate in the future. First, let's discuss the primary strategies being implemented to improve agility and flexibility in the supply chain. Much of the recovery discussion has to do with building a more resilient supply chain. Doug, why was the supply chain so vulnerable to a disruption like the COVID-19 pandemic? And what are supply chain and logistics professionals doing to address the resiliency problem? 
Thank you, Megan. You know, it's a it's a really interesting question uh, that is multifaceted in its response. You know, one of the things that I've seen through a number of studies and different interactions I've had with our customer community, in supply chains, there's been a lack of adaptability. And, and what I mean by that is there's been, you know, fixed suppliers, uh, long lead times from a global supply network, you know, trade movement restrictions impacted by COVID-19, and the lack of alternate sourcing uh, and reliance on specific ports of import and so on have created uh, a tremendous amount of disruption with the restrictions on travel and uh, some of the human dependency elements have also impacted what uh, distributing uh, companies, manufacturers, and supply chains are experiencing because of staff reductions related to social distancing or lockdowns, quarantines, and so on have created a lack of resilience. And what we've seen is blending uh, technology and labor to respond to changes and disruptions are a strategy that can be employed to help overcome some of these disruptions. You know, another impacting factor uh, that, that creates kind of a rigidity or a lack of flexibility or resiliency is, you know, kind of the lean inventory strategies that have been employed just in time. And when there's major disruptions in the supply chain network, the ability to deliver just in time is negated. And so diversify, diversifying a supply um, network is really an, uh, a strategy that can be employed that reduces that single source, reduces those long lead times, and, rest and the restrictions associated with a single source of supply for raw materials or component goods for assembly and manufacturing as necessary. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done and many that we're seeing being done where customers are leveraging new technologies, uh, artificial intelligence for optimization, you know, different elements within their existing structures to create better visibility from an overall supply chain data perspective to perform more analytical evaluation and generate more visibility to where is inventory in the overall network and where can potential expedited elements be done, different diversifications may be necessary, and what are alternate sourcing paths that could be um, initiated to overcome some of the disruptions. So there's a lot of elements. The other thing that we're seeing in many respects is an acceleration of automation. You know, there are a lot of providers that uh, have, have gone down the path of automating in their facilities, whether those are automated manufacturing systems, whether those are, you know, uh, AGVs or AMRs, which are uh, uh, autonomous mobile robots, autonomous guided vehicles, for the movement of product within to help maintain some of the social distancing requirements as a result of the impacts of COVID-19. So there are a lot of factors and a lot of things that can be implemented and adjusted to start to address what happens if this reoccurs. Really interesting. Thank you for sharing those insights. A related trend we're seeing in the supply chain has to do with reshoring manufacturing assets from places like China as a method of creating that resiliency. This trend started to snowball because of the U.S.-China trade war and then grew even more rapidly in popularity, in popularity because of the pandemic. A survey last summer said that 64% of manufacturers say that reshoring is likely following the pandemic. So why are manufacturers turning to reshoring? What's the appeal? And how does it help to increase supply chain resiliency for an organization? Thanks, Megan. Um, well, first of all, because they don't have any more choice than, than to do it. Uh, Doug talked about uh, disruption and the complexity of supply chain. And indeed, this is something that uh, we were seeing and then we were somewhat all fueling that complexity. And, uh, and we did see uh, some very long lead times uh, that were being deployed uh, with, uh, with, with global supply chain happening. And uh, in these cases, we as uh, consumers or we as, uh, as companies were accepting these lead, long lead times because they provided it with, uh, with very significant uh, economies of scales. 
Uh, but uh, we did realize through the disruption that uh, this this had to change, and and we were already seeing um, some of re- some activities on reshoring uh, over the past two years, I would say, uh, for for trade reasons uh, and uh, and economic reason, and and this is just going to be increasing uh, from what we can expect in in the coming years, because people have realized that they were very sensitive to. Uh, to any link in that supply chain being uh, being disrupted or failing, uh, we when we saw uh, the Chinese market shutting down, when we saw afterwards uh, ports or planes being grounded, uh, we were able to quickly see the impact of these uh, these long lead times. And therefore, people will first of all, for for pure survival reason, decide that they need to uh, to have somewhat of a um, of a backup plan, which which most likely will become their their main plan of reshoring back into uh, the continent, and um, this indeed is going to bring complexity of uh, of some aspects of supply chain. But on the other end, should bring a lot of simplicity in where we'll see less uh, less individuals or less uh, companies involved in the supply chain, and also a uh, somewhat of a reduction of the lead time. Uh, one may say that, that this is, uh, you know, the, the initial reason why people offshored was uh, for economies of scales and also for a for a cost reduction. Um, we we did see, as uh, Doug mentioned before, some uh, pretty drastic improvement in automation and in uh, in in systems enabling us to today reduce the um, the cost of. Uh, the cost of labor, as well as the cost of producing goods and distributing goods. And we can expect that uh, companies will be able to leverage these technology to justify or minimize the impact of reshoring uh, in, uh, back in the U.S. or in Canada. The, um, and this will be further fuel in some industries where there is just a, a need or uh, an obligation now to be self-sufficient. We did see it in the uh, first in the masks, then in all of the uh, sanitation or all of the um, health uh, goods, and uh, and now we're we're seeing companies and and, and countries even more uh, wanting to be uh, self-sufficient for for the vaccines. Uh, every country, every state wants to have its own uh, vaccine production plan so that they can guarantee the uh, the supply of the goods to the population. And the population itself became much more sensitive to these things because we did see the shelf uh, in the stores uh, becoming empty. We did see some shortages uh, that were due not only to the uh, the local distributor's uh, issues, but in, in many cases to the, the supply itself. And therefore, we can expect that uh, the consumer will be ready to uh, to pay somewhat a more expensive uh, cost uh, to, to buy goods where they can be ensured that the supply will be, uh, will be um, safe. Uh, the, um, and then in the other, what was also uh, pushing the, um, the reshoring was uh, some movements uh, for the, uh, the green supply chain where people were saying, well, we need to have a green or carbon footprint or at least minimize that carbon footprint. And therefore, that was uh, fueling or enabling companies to justify local uh, markets and local distribution. Um, just uh, justifying a project on the, uh, on the environment, sadly enough, was not uh, enough to, uh, in many cases, to justify these, uh, these plants or distribution centers to be built. Uh, but I would suspect that now with the, uh, the the crisis that we've lived through, people will realize that, uh, okay, there, again, there might be a small premium, but uh, there's not only uh, a much safer and secure supply chain, but uh, a side pretty big benefit is that uh, we're going to be uh, seeing some significant increases in the uh, green supply chain and in the reduction of the carbon footprint. And, and, one could expect that eventually uh, what seemed to be unreachable in terms of uh, levels of uh, emission of uh, carbon monoxide may be just uh, around the corner. And we've seen it during the, uh, 
the confinement that there was, uh, you know, the ozone layer uh, rebuilt itself, and, uh, and we did see that pretty quickly. We can have a pretty drastic impact on um, on the environment. So one thing to add in regards to the resiliency uh, in conjunction with self-sufficiency is also the adaptability when you own or operate your own facilities, the ability to retool and adjust based on diversifying demands. Um, we've seen that in the in the North American market with uh, ventilators being retooled from local manufacturing or mask makers, you know, taking a paper plant of something of that nature and shifting accordingly. You know, in other areas, if you are globally diverse and the manufacturing facilities are not under your own control, there are going to be constraints. So I think that's one of the elements of nearshoring that will allow for resiliency and flexibility is to adjust more with more agility, if you will, to a shift in uh, demand patterns. Great. Thank you both. And with all those points that you mentioned, it's easy to see why reshoring has become such a popular topic. And it actually relates to the next topic, which is about the shift happening in distribution and fulfillment. Retailers are finding they can't survive without omnichannel, while manufacturers are implementing direct-to-consumer sales to create new revenue streams. I'm going to throw this one out to the whole panel. What impact will this have on the ways we handle distribution and fulfillment? Thanks, Megan. I'll jump in first on this. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's a it's something that's pretty near and dear to me, uh, having run and lived in, a, in an omni-channel operation. Um, the impacts of the changes in buying patterns are, are really, really large. You know, what previously was uh, a lot of store replenishment type of fulfillment work happening in the retail space where you're picking larger quantities and consolidating cases onto a pallet and then shipping those out to uh, a series of stores on a route – has now become drastically different because those same store routes have to include the BOPUS, buy online, pick up in store type orders in order not to deplete the shelf stock, but also fulfill that consumer demand. So new picking strategies to um, accommodate these variable demands are really important and they're making a shift. So you're seeing a blended process of picking versus discrete order picking or large bulk quantity picking, but a blend of the two. The DCs have to learn to pick smaller orders for those e-com and those BOPUS orders, if you will. And uh, that requires some different equipment and some different processes than just traditional store fulfillment. And then there's a need to consolidate those diversities on the floor before loading the truck to continue to minimize the number of shipments, the number of movements by truck that need to happen. And some DC solutions are, are starting to incorporate what was previously not very relevant, RFID technologies in uh, some of the goods to track them within the facility and ensure they are where they need to be in order to be fulfilled. And then manufacturers you know, they're benefiting uh, from these new or, you know, I'll call them multi, uh, multi-flow multi support systems because they're enabling themselves to incorporate direct-to-consumer fulfillment directly from the manufacturing sites without having to go through the retail channel but still maintaining their retail channel uh, distribution. So they also have now a new wrinkle okay. – that is more omnichannel oriented. You know, so often omnichannel is looked at just from an order taking perspective, right? Online or via the phone or at the store, those type of things. But the omnichannel fulfillment side is also looking at differing order profiles, differing item profiles, and the ability to pick them, uh, you know, together and satisfy ultimately the new demand patterns that everyone's seeing. So it really is about uh, fulfilling a diversity and an ever-changing demand. And I think on the consumer side, some of the things that, uh, that I'm seeing, uh, both personally and uh, I believe our customers as well, 
is a little bit of a shift from the instant gratification of I need it today and a willingness to say I'll take it tomorrow if I know I can have it versus going to the store and not being able to find it. So that available to promise element of omnichannel fulfillment is really important, which comes back to the inventory visibility, the supply chain data elements that can be leveraged to ensure that customer expectations are met, managed, and met to ensure that customer retention and satisfying that overall need. Yeah, so adding to uh, to what Doug said, in, indeed, it's, it's changing, and then we see it at all levels. Uh, we talked about the retailers and the manufacturers. In between that, there's uh, there's a player that used to be extremely important, which is the the wholesaler or the middleman. Um, these guys need to uh, obviously reinvent themselves, uh, where in the past they had the uh, the buying power to buy and then afterwards to uh, to distribute at the unit level in the uh, in the stores or to the uh, to the consumer directly. Uh, when um, when we see retailers uh, going with omnichannel distribution or even manufacturers going directly to consumers, uh, that middleman is uh, is losing its uh, its let's say uh, relevance in the in the supply chain and. Um, so there's a big uh, there's a big challenge there, uh, and within these uh, different levels, we've also seen, as Doug was saying, a a quest for technology uh, as companies realize that uh, in some cases they selected uh, uh, automation or they decided to mechanize some of their processes to be extremely efficient in doing one thing, and they invested heavily into that. And today, some companies, unfortunately, are realizing that that investment is just not viable uh, anymore because it's not adapted to an omnichannel distribution where where you need to sometimes ship pallets, uh, layers, cases, and even units. And, um, and, and, and we've seen that coming in the past years where companies are now uh, – uh, moving away from heavy automation or heavy mechanization to more flexible operations, uh, quick turnarounds, as we said uh, previously, uh, where these companies can adapt, can uh, can scale up, scale down their operations, just like we're doing uh, with uh, a server or a file for storage uh, on the web. They want to be able to do the same with their operation. So if uh, We've got, if we're running into the Christmas season, we know there's going to be a lot of uh, unit picking because we're going to be shipping directly to the cons consumers. Uh, whereas maybe in the uh, slower months, we're shipping to uh, more of the retail or uh, different distribution channels. And therefore, we, we can resize our operation accordingly. And, and people have been asking for these technologies. Uh, the cobots, the AMRs are able to answer some of that as well as pretty strong systems enabling you to uh, to switch from one order prep mode to another one. And one other element I didn't mention previously, but uh, bears mentioning in this with the direct-to-consumer fulfillment side is the move towards, you know, almost what's referred to as a micro distribution center or a smaller footprint DC there are some retail stores that are taking their brick and mortar stores and basically closing them to be more of a neighborhood DC. So enabling that store inventory to be fulfilled, uh, shipped from store. And then alternately, there is the last mile elements of distribution or delivery that is being impacted as well, because not everybody is able or comfortable in the current landscape of the environment with the pandemic of going out to the store. So the last mile shippers have been building up and leveraging their networks. What usually was, you know, fourth quarter in, in North America, the Christmas holiday season called peak, they're seeing more volumes related to peak. So they've had the infrastructure in play to help facilitate the last mile changes that are coming into play and shortening the delivery the, the delivery last mile from more of a local distribution rather than large, large regional distribution operations. Yeah, and potentially one could expect that, uh, you know, companies will not be able to uh, 
uh, to have all of these, uh, all of that real estate uh, throughout the uh, throughout the U.S. to to supply that proximity to the consumer, and um, and we may see uh, you know a new type of uh, 3PLs or third-party logistics providers uh, coming up where they it's maybe a, a rehash of the wholesaler uh, reinventing himself. Uh, but there's going to be a need to uh, to operate all these uh, micro sites, uh, as Doug was saying. Great, thank you. It seems like one of the key answers there is about technology implementation, which leads right into our next topic. Supply chain stakeholders of all types have increasingly turned to technology solutions to combat challenges posed by talent shortages, natural disasters, trade wars, and most recently, the pandemic. What technologies do you think will become most widespread among manufacturers and logistics operators in this new normal? Yes, uh, you know, one of the, you know, items that I believe will definitely become widespread is, um, you know, implementation of industrial robots. You know, I could speak for our business. Um, you know, that's something that we were, we were ahead of. We were able to implement this, this pre, you know, this previous year for both case packing and pilotizing to, you know, reduce that labor burden as well as allow us to, to social distance with the, pending COVID pandemic, um, automating processes, you know, PLC programming, um, you know, allows us to, to reduce that labor force, um, utilizing the SCADA system, uh, supervising control and data acquisition system to allow us to, again, control our facilities and processes and, and gather great, uh, great data. You know, we're, Speaking for our business again, we're, you know, implementation of a continuous improvement or a lean principles, you know, identifying ways and opportunities to uh, to become more efficient as well as, you know, looking at our, our labor burden. Um, you know, one other item that the, the pandemic has kind of forced us to, to do was, you know, really understand how COVID impacts our suppliers because uh, ultimately that would that would uh, impact our our business. So really working with our vendors, uh, our packaging vendors, and bulk assays uh, to make sure that that supply chain is is strong. Interesting, uh, Salvador. And 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 you you said it. Uh, you know it's. It's great to automate. It's great to uh, look into these solutions, but uh, I would say the first place where we need uh, to look into is how we can reduce waste, how we can do things better the first time. Uh, so that comes with indeed quality. It comes with uh, lean principles, with uh, with training of resources, because we we didn't touch on that too much yet, but. Uh, you know the labor shortage that we were living through uh, a year ago is is going to come back. Is it's a reality that that we have to live through? Uh, working in manufacturing environments or warehouses is not is not extremely appealing to uh, to many uh, young workers, and and therefore we'll have to find ways to uh, to do more with less. So automation is indeed uh, a great uh, pathway. But uh, but making sure we do things right the first time is um, is critical, and um, and also um, making sure that uh, that systems which are somewhat automation uh, can be viewed as automation that that systems provide uh, the uh, the workers and the operators with uh, with optimization tools where you can reduce traveling where you can optimize movement of goods, where you can make sure that uh, when you're doing something, you're doing it uh, ahead of a need, uh, and therefore uh, you're kind of reducing idle time of the operators. So that, that's a big area of optimization is, uh, is, is systems. The second one I would say would be uh, the cobots or, or light automation. We, uh, as I said before, we, we we ventured too much into heavy automation in the past, and uh, it's proving to be uh, 
not helping companies today be flexible and agile. Uh, today, cobots uh, or or AGVs or robots can can take some of the uh, heavy lifting uh, work uh, away from the operations, uh, reduce labor uh, dependency, but uh, make sure the operations remain flexible and um, and adapting to change. Yeah, those are really good points, uh, Sal and, uh, and and Phil. You know, when we were pre-COVID, um, you know, in North America, we were seeing an unemployment rate of only 3.5%. So it was really hard to find labor, you know, and that forced companies to start injecting automation. But to Phil's point, the high automation and heavy uh, fixed automation elements are really not uh, suited for flexibility or adaptation. And so the the move towards the lighter weight, um, you know, robotics type solutions, they're a little easier to implement from a timing perspective, they're not fixed and linear, so they provide the ability to allow for, for some variability. When you start adding new features and new functions, technology that can advance that, you know, as mentioned in the slide, the, the IoT, the Internet of Things, is bringing about greater visibility and better tracking, not just in goods and processes, but even in the facilities for preventative maintenance elements and sensors uh, technologies that can feed uh, operating systems with statuses and updates to ensure that you're alleviating or minimizing maintenance downtime or maintenance uh, breakage uh, within a facility that has automation or within a facility that's using different machinery. So those devices help for the ability to respond to, you know, sudden changes or know where you may need to make some uh, maintenance adaptations associated with things, you know, and then when you talk about lean and you talk about, you know, doing it right, doing it right the first time, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning type algorithms and technologies are inherently built to learn. And the learning process is kind of ever happening. So it's like evolutionary technology that in and of itself becomes smarter and therefore improved in its responsiveness and able to better adjust and accommodate demand spikes where it's necessary. So what that does is ultimately brings about maximizing the utilization of the resources that are being employed to satisfy the fulfillment of the demand. And that can happen at every layer from, you know, supply chain you know, from manufacturing and sourcing and uh, billing and picking and packing and shipping, all of those elements. And there's a, a particular type of technology vendor in the supply chain that starts to really be well-suited for that. Generis happens to be one of them that has a suite of products that are complementary that allow for uh, a, a single technology source that can provide you know, uh, warehouse management, transportation management, supply chain visibility elements, you know, manufacturing execution, et cetera, to create a synergized approach from a technology perspective to overcome some of the disruptions and have better visibility and overall plan of how to address uh, variables that, uh, that come about due to any number of things, natural disasters, pandemic, you know, uh, personnel shortages, uh, changes in demand patterns, uh, just just uh, organically, uh, et cetera. So there's a lot of different factors that can be leveraged to address those things. Yeah, and even I would I would add to to Doug's point regarding the unemployment. We, as employers need to, uh, and it's even more the case, as I was saying, in, in warehouses and manufacturing site, they need to be appealing places or fun places to work into. And, um, and for the, the younger generations, automation, systems, uh, even gamification can, can or and will be uh, something that's going to appeal to them and will be almost required to, to keep your labor. If not, they'll move on to a more, to a funnier place to work at. 
Great. Thank you all. So there's definitely a theme then in what you've all been saying here. And I think that theme has to do with moving away from reactivity in favor of better preparedness. Preparedness has become essential for every manufacturer, retail, logistics operators, or really any business hoping to ride out additional waves of COVID-19, as well as natural disasters, global trade instability, political turmoil, and other major disruptions. I'm going to throw this out to the whole panel again. What can leaders in the manufacturing and supply chain sectors do to become proactive instead of reactive? Well, first of all, thanks, Megan. First of all, I would say that uh, we have all realized that the, the impossible can happen. And we, we've realized that uh, the people tell, that were telling us uh, that we should be doing a, uh, a DRP, uh, you know, everything related to, uh, to disaster recovery planning, uh, which, which seemed to be just something you had to do if you really had nothing else to do uh, is, is really required because companies have seen that, that they are extremely sensitive to, uh, to a disruption, even though it was a huge disruption. I think we were all convinced that uh, these things can and will happen again. We, uh, uh, it could be a natural disaster. It could be uh, you know, a chemical or or, or a virus like we've lived through. So, so people now realize they need. To, to plan for these things and uh, and have backup solutions. So having a plan B, a plan C is now uh, is now required, and uh, um, and and they've also realized that uh, in many. Many cases, uh, some of their uh, their weak links were because they had one or two individuals in the company that that knew how to do something or were operating a system, and when that person person got sick or had family uh, that was sick or had to be quarantined, then they were left uh, uh, standing with, with no solution. So, uh, so people uh, we expect will be returning in, in our industry to more of a uh, SaaS uh, environment where they'll be uh, saying, okay, we do not want to have uh, uh, a, a huge team being a backup of a backup. Let's rely on companies that, that do that for a living and, and have the infrastructure to support that, uh, to, to make sure our systems can, can still operate while our IT director is uh, maybe sick or, uh, or, or maybe a quarantine. So the, um, so These uh, these 
reality will most likely trigger some some changes in the behavior and in the buying behavior and also on the paradigms that we had where we all, all felt that we needed to have uh, everything in-house. Uh, we, we've talked about that need for, for some of the manufacturing and distribution, but other topics Uh, will most likely say because our employees may not be working from home uh, as uh, as remote uh, uh, will become a, a normality. Uh, then being on the cloud and making sure we've got got access everywhere is going going to be uh, even more a, a, uh, an expectations from people. You know, one of the, the things that we, we in the, uh, in the hop industry, it's a very, it's very challenging. You know, it's a, it's the crop, um, you know, that, is planted, um, you know, early March or so. So you really have to have a good understanding of, you know, what consumers want, what variety of hops. You know, we've got many variety of different hops that, that you know, create a different food flavor profile. Uh, um, so we got to understand what what customers or consumers want in their in their palate for their beers. Uh, um, so really, really, you know, incorporating data science to, to get away Kind of from that tribal knowledge, but really understanding, you know, uh, how we're going to use that information to, to plan our acreage. Um, you know, we were very um, with the, the pandemic. Uh, really hitting home here in 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 March. It allowed us um, to understand the supply chain and kind of pivot our our planning or our acreage of hops uh, to, to not create an oversupply. Um, so in, in our business, it, it is very challenging. Um, because you're doing, dealing with a harvest, um, so sometimes, you know, it's a timeliness of when you can pivot. Yeah, that makes makes perfect sense, Salvador. <clears throat> you know, when I when I think about you know uh, the, the question at hand, what can leaders do? But, you know, from my perspective, having having run in the operations space for much of my career and now being in the, you know, technology provision space, really is the 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 the, the learning of the holistic supply chain, really understanding the the underlying 
processes and procedures throughout the entirety of the supply chain and becoming more collaborative with uh, providers and vendors. You know, uh, Salvador mentioned kind of that tribal knowledge. Oftentimes, you know, those types of processes and procedures are maintained and managed through tribal knowledge type scenarios. So definitive documentation associated with decision points and uh, the details and definitions associated with how and when and what triggers different actions within the supply chain regarding buy, regarding transportation, regarding vendor management, regarding inventory levels, regarding fulfillment operations and processes, all of those elements to be clearly understood allows you then to adjust and adapt as need be. You know, secondarily, I think there's the need to invest uh, properly uh, into the, the right technology profile to address business objectives and uh, overcome limitations that were exposed uh, before, during, and will, al will also be after uh, this global pandemic. You know, business intelligence and data visibility is, is, is really of paramount importance in many industries because that allows the, the, the creation of synergies between providers and vendors. That overall data visibility is really important, but also the technological elements that move product through any different supply chain. Um, we've talked about AGVs and AMRs. You know, the other things can be, you know, um, you know, conveyor-based systems or uh, shuttle-based storage arrays, uh, what's referred to as ASRS technologies, those type of things need to be evaluated and invest in the proper technology that allows you to be flexible within your environment. And then, as I said early on in the, in the conversation today, is diversify the supply chain base, right? Diversify your suppliers. Instead of having a linear single point, a more resilient uh, supply chain provides multiple points of entry that also helps to keep competitiveness from a cost perspective in play and then work towards the lean, you know, kind of the Six Sigma oriented type of mentality. Once you know your operations, they're defined and clearly uh, documented, then you can start to look at where are their gaps and where are their places in which you can refine to proactively be in a position to uh, overcome disaster, uh, the DRP plan that Phil was mentioning, or overcome a supplier shortage or failure as a result of whatever. Maybe it's a natural disaster, or maybe it's a, a health crisis in a given supplier's region or something of that nature. So really knowing uh, all of the players in your supply chain and understanding all of the trigger points and then addressing gaps uh, and creating redundancy as opportunistic uh, changes are needed based on the current landscape. And Doug, uh, to add to your point um, regarding collaborations and having uh, many suppliers, what people have realized during the, the crisis was that uh, collaboration was uh, was critical to, to make things happen. Whereas in the past, we uh, we used to uh, to receive a forecast from a uh, from a customer and say, well, okay, I've got, a, I've got this forecast, but I don't really trust him. I'll either add, uh, multiply it by two or divide it by two because I know he's always um, either lowballing it or being too uh, too optimistic. People have realized that uh, whenever there's a, a tight and a shortage of supply, then we need to, to trust each other and to be uh, uh, to, to tell the truth. And, and one could therefore expect that, um, that people will be more open to sharing data, sharing forecasts, uh, to ensure that we don't just overproduce of something and, uh, and then have a huge uh, back order on other products. Uh, so one can expect that uh, through systems and collaboration, uh, we'll be able to, uh, to reach these things. 
that's really great information. And I'd like to talk about how the things we've talked about today will translate into practice moving into next year as we hopefully begin to put the pandemic in our rear view mirror. If we created a list of new best practices for your field today, what would you want to see on there? Uh, again, speaking from, from the manufacturing and production side, um, you know, a lot of focus on technology, um, again, automated systems, um, speaking, speaking earlier about, um, kind of having that flex, you know, having that flexibility, um, sometimes isn't, isn't necessarily provided with, um, you know, certain robotic technologies, um, but again, speaking in, in the industry I'm involved in, um, we've limited a lot of our, our product skews, so it allows us to implement uh, technologies to kind of a fixed package size um, in our in our main production facilities. Um, and, and once again, also touching on um, a SCADA system or a supervisory control system um, to capture that information. Uh, allow us to automate our processes as well as, you know, achieve valuable data uh, that allow, allow us to, to continue to optimize our processes. Thanks, Salvador. You know, really in a lot of respects, the slide uh, uh, showing right now speaks to where uh, I believe best practices need to be, you know, defined. You know, diversifying uh, the supplier base uh, allows some resiliency and 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 in continues the you know uh, cost uh, cost savings cost uh, measures in place with competition um, technology adoption the ability to adopt new technology with effective uh, best practices and change management right defining the target defining the goal not just going out and spending uh, budget money that maybe you have as a result of uh, the COVID crisis or something of that nature, but really evaluating what are the long-term goals and what are the technologies that can be adopted in order to do that. And that really is about embracing that change, but being um, using foresight and really planning out what that adoption will look like and what it needs to be. The other thing is sustainability. It was mentioned earlier, uh, I think, by Phil in regards to nearshoring. Um, you know, the, 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 the green aspect of the supply chain, because it's become uh, such a, a, a critical uh, political topic, uh, environmental topic, just world topic, quite frankly, sustainability is a, a really big key in which people need to focus on is the sustainability. I could see, you know, technology evolution getting to sustainability ratings associated with product that really are going to be fed solely by the supply chain uh, and the technologies embedded within the supply chain to provide some sort of a sustainability rating, right? You know, what is the uh, the overall ecological impact of buying that product? And that could then influence some of the delivery timelines and expectations on the consumer side. So st sustainability is a, is a big piece of that as well. You know, and lastly, what I'll say is, you know, really, really understand Supply chain's taken a, a larger focus over the last five to ten years than maybe it had in the past. It always used to kind of be, you know, back a house, just a cost center, so on and so forth. But in the in the global pandemic, uh, it really became uh, a forefront view as essential. You know, the supply chain workers are essential workers because without supply chains, we don't have the necessary health care. We don't have the necessary PPE in the current environment. We don't have uh, the groceries and the consumer goods that allow us to live. So supply chain has become essential and a huge focus. So uh, hang on to that uh, designation as essential and really plan out how you can sustain, how you can embrace change, how you can adopt new technology and diversify uh, your supply chain in whole to have a more uh, effective ability to meet the consumer needs and your company objectives. I like that. 
Uh, I like that because, and so, well, first of all, one thing we, we can all agree to is that everybody now knows uh, the word uh, supply chain and also the word logistics. These, uh, for, for many of us uh, uh, working in that field, these were uh, uh, people, uh, words that we always had to define or explain to our family and friends. Uh, now everybody knows about uh, the meaning and the uh, and let's say the criticality of these uh, these jobs. Um, I've talked about uh, the fact that indeed we need to find ways to uh, to make the work uh, because it, it remains a difficult work. The, the work of truckers and the work of uh, warehouse employees uh, easier, safer, and also uh, funnier to work into. Uh, so, so companies will have to look into how we can gamify the work. Um, one thing we've also realized is the need to, uh, uh, I've talked about collaboration and trust, so therefore make sure that, uh, that we're not uh, always uh, sandbagging for the other one and, and, and building inventory or building inefficiency in our processes. Uh, there's way too many uh, uh, potential uh, failure points uh, that we've seen that we need now to, to build trust and, um, and clarity in the supply chain to make sure that, um, that we remain ag agile uh, in, in everything that we do. The, the other thing that um, I think uh, we didn't talk about uh, is, is some companies in the past months have, uh, have suffered greatly uh, because of the, uh, the, the changes, either their stores were closed, the, the restaurants were closed for some, uh, or their businesses just went bankrupt. And, and some of these people, uh, it, being in a survival mode, reinvented themselves. And, um, and we did see great stories uh, of companies reinventing or changing their, their model completely. Uh, there are others that have changed or are thinking about change that we haven't seen yet. And, and I think that some companies that did not suffer too much uh, may be up to a great uh, challenge in the coming months or years because they have not thought about re reinventing themselves and therefore will most likely be cut by, uh, by another competitor or a new, new world that has new, a new competitor, a new environment, that is completely changing the rules of uh, the industry in which they are. You talked, Megan, about uh, putting the virus in our rearview mirror. Well, I think that um, we need to look into our rearview mirror more often than see these guys that may be, uh, you know, small players today, but that would quickly um, completely change the rules of the, uh, the industry uh, that we live in. That's a really great point. Thank you. And those are some really great tips. I hope that some of our viewers today will take them to heart and implement these best practices into their own supply chains. So we're nearing the end of our time here today, but we wanted to take a little time to answer questions submitted by our viewers during the course of the webinar. So I'm just going to throw these questions out there and any one of you can feel free to answer them. The first one is, what do you think is the single most useful tool for building resilience into a manufacturer's supply chain right now? This is Doug. I think, you know, probably the most useful tool, it, it, there's not a single silver bullet tool. Um, I think it's a combination of uh, diversifying the supply and uh, investing in technologies that provide uh, collaborative visibility uh, to the supply chain as a whole. Great. Thank you. And our next question my shop won't survive another disruption like the coronavirus. What are some steps we should be taking right now to ride out any potential new waves of COVID-19? Hmm. You know, I being, being that in the manufacturing um, and, and currently myself being in the thick of it, uh, really, again, just focusing on safety for your employees, putting, putting your, your controls in place, to, to help the, the prevent uh, the spread of the COVID-19, um, you know, social distancing. It, uh, it, um, we're, we're definitely seeing the impact of, of the second wave um, by putting 
some safety measures in, in place and uh, sanitation, additional sanitation stations is probably very beneficial to, to us. Great. And the next question, everyone is talking about reshoring, but there's already a shortage of skilled workers to fill jobs at the manufacturers we have. Do we have the labor pool to support reshoring? Uh, we've talked about this this topic before indeed, and uh, there, there was a labor shortage. That there will be one uh, pretty soon. Uh, so what do we have to do? First of all, we, we need to make the work and logistics appealing. Uh, Doug talked about being an essential service. Uh, I think this will bring more people to uh, to show interest in uh, in helping and uh, and working in these environments. Secondly, is to make sure we we automate what needs to be automated, and then making sure we do things right the first time and stop wasting energy redoing and verifying things. Um, this should bring labor uh, or labor potential and productivity to the operations. Perfect, thank you. And then next question, our ERP didn't give us the agility we wanted during the pandemic. Can you talk about what an, e what an MES has to offer in terms of agility and resiliency for manufacturers? So that's a great question. I don't know uh, what the ERP did give from an agility perspective, but uh, what an MES does provide is the ability for agile responses versus uh, fixed reactive responses when things come in that disrupt uh, the supply chain or the manufacturing process. An example I'll use in the U.S., we saw a shortage in toilet paper. Uh, and MES might be in a position where, let's say, you're manufacturing in a toilet paper facility large commercial size uh, containers of toilet paper. And the consumer shortage is there due to, you know, panic buying and things that happened early on. There could have been a uh, reverse manufacturing order that could be done to take the consumer quantity packaged uh, goods and bring them back into component inventory and then subsequently repackage to more consumer oriented packaging quantities to overcome that. That's something that an MES could do that generally speaking an ERP is not necessarily set up to do. So it's really about more the smaller quantity manufacturing runs than the holistic enterprise resource plan associated with delivering a finished good to the market. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question, do you have any tips about successful implementation of D2C? Well, I think we've touched, touched a lot on, on these topics before. Um, so it's about, uh, well, it's a similar to uh, any project. So it's making sure while well, you plan well, you understand the market you want to service. Uh, we've talked about micro distribution centers. The last mile remains a big struggle and a big uh, topic. So that these are, you need to know the environment that you're going to be distributing into, uh, distributing to the consumer, uh, and, uh, and then planning for that, and then looking for uh, economies of scales where you can leverage transportation or delivery with other partners and, uh, and distribution as well. Perfect. Uh, next question. We weren't far along on our shift to a digital environment when COVID-19 hit. What advice can you give to help us accelerate our transition? I would say in many respects, you know, uh, understand the technology partners that you're working with. Uh, start to evaluate uh, SaaS-oriented software solutions that uh, can help you get to a, a cloud-oriented infrastructure so that remote workers can connect and so on. In the distribution environment, there's a combination or layers of workers. You know, the, the management, the supervisory, the leadership, a lot of times is, it can work remote where then there are hands-on workers there. In order to be able to monitor and manage from maybe a remote uh, situation, the digital transition is really a key element in that. The acceleration is really about uh, identifying what are the key elements that you need uh, visibility or that you need to digitize and then working with the technology providers in um, 
in that space to 